So you want to go to college or career school. Maybe you started saving early. Maybe you'll discover some buried treasure, but more likely you'll need another plan. So if paying for college is going to fall on your shoulders, the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Federal Student Aid is the best place to turn for assistance. I bet you didn't know that we're the largest provider of grants, loans, and work-study funds, all of which are easy to apply for. And when it is time to apply for aid, head to your favorite spot to complete the free application for federal student aid, or FAFSA. Each October, a new FAFSA is available for the next school year, and completing it is free when you go to the official website, fafsa.gov. Your selected colleges will use the information on your FAFSA to figure out how much aid you'll get, so make sure your info is accurate. But if you need to, you can go back and make some changes. If you get a grant or work-study job, congrats, you won't have to pay the money back. However, a federal loan is borrowed money, and you'll need to promise to repay it. Remember to borrow only what you need because a federal student loan is a real loan. Just like with a car or home loan, it's important that you understand what you're agreeing to. Although college, financial aid, and the prospect of an instant noodle diet can be a little overwhelming, you'll be putting yourself on the path to success when you take the time to plan out your options and let the Office of Federal Student Aid help you along the way. If you have questions or need more information, please visit studentaid.gov. If you need help paying for college or career school, the Office of Federal Student Aid might be your best option. We offer more than $150 billion to students each year in the form of grants, loans, and work-study funds. And federal student aid can be used to pay for school expenses, such as tuition, room and board, and books and supplies. After you've filled out the free application for federal student aid, or FAFSA, you'll receive an award letter from each school you list on your FAFSA. This letter explains both the federal and non-federal financial aid options that a school is offering you. So let's talk about federal aid. If you qualify for and receive a federal grant, you won't have to repay the money. That will definitely help offset the cost of school, but you may still need additional help. If so, a federal student loan might be your answer. Remember, a student loan is just like any other loan. It's borrowed money that will have to be repaid with interest. If you plan to take out a loan, Consider federal student loans first. Compared to private student loans, federal student loans often have lower fixed interest rates and offer many benefits that you won't find otherwise. For example, when it's time for you to repay your federal student loan, your loan servicer can work with you to find the best repayment plan for your individual needs. Plus, you may be able to adjust your loan payments based on your income. You also may be able to defer your federal loan payments, deduct student loan interest on your taxes, and even consolidate your eligible federal student loans into one loan with one monthly payment. Federal loans can even be forgiven based on certain types of employment. Getting a work-study job is another great option to help pay for school. Eligible undergraduate and graduate students will be able to earn at least minimum wage. If you have questions or need assistance, you can contact the financial aid office at your college or career school or visit studentaid.gov for more information. If you're interested in financial aid for college or career school, you're going to need to fill out the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, or FAFSA. It takes most people about 30 minutes to complete online, and the best part, it's 100% free, and it provides you with access to grants, loans, and work-study funds from the federal government. And many colleges and states use FAFSA information to provide their own college or state financial aid. Before you fill out the FAFSA, it's a good idea to create your FSA ID, a username and password that lets you electronically sign your FAFSA and gives you access to various websites related to federal student aid. And here's an important tip. If your parent is providing information on your FAFSA, he or she will need his or her own FSA ID. Visit studentaid.gov forward slash FSA ID for more information. Your FAFSA can be completed online at fafsa.gov and help is provided throughout the online application process. You will need to fill out the FAFSA each year you are in school because your financial situation may change. Plus, you may be able to automatically transfer your tax data from the IRS, making the application even quicker to fill out. Each state and college or career school sets its own deadline for the FAFSA, so it's best to get it done early. 
Since some of the funds are available on a first-come, first-served basis, you don't want to miss out. Now that you know about the FAFSA, you might be asking, well, how much money will I get? Your college or career school will do the math, and there's a simple formula that they use. First, the college takes your cost of attendance, which is the total amount it will cost you to go to that school. Your cost of attendance will vary from school to school. Then, the college subtracts your expected family contribution, or EFC. Your EFC is based on information provided in your FAFSA and will not change based on the school you attend. However, the EFC is not necessarily the amount of money you will have to pay. Basically, your cost of attendance minus your EFC equals your financial need. Your college uses your financial need and other information to determine how much financial aid you can receive. See? Pretty simple. If you have questions or need more information, please visit studentaid.gov. The Free Application for Federal Student Aid, or FAFSA, is the application for grants, loans, and work-study funds provided by the federal government. It is also used by many states and schools for their financial aid programs. For the fastest and easiest way to apply, visit our official website, fafsa.gov. The FAFSA is available in English and Spanish. As you fill it out online, you'll be able to automatically skip questions that don't pertain to you, check out your status immediately, and get online help. It takes most people less than 30 minutes to complete the application. You'll need a few things when you fill it out, so get ready by gathering your Social Security number, your permanent resident card if you have one, any W-2 forms or records of money you earned for the previous year, and your tax records. By the way, a nice time-saving feature of the FAFSA is that many people are eligible to automatically transfer their tax data from the IRS into the FAFSA, so keep an eye out while you're applying in case you're offered that option. If you have any questions about what information to gather, there is a complete list of documents that you will need at FAFSA.gov. Before you begin the process of filling out the FAFSA, you should create a username and password called an FSA ID that will act as your electronic signature. You'll only need to create an FSA ID once, and you can use it to renew your FAFSA each year that you apply. Your parents will need an FSA ID too if they have to provide any information. So now you're ready to begin filling out the FAFSA to apply for financial aid. There are three groups of questions that include personal information, such as your name, address, and marital status, financial information, such as your income, and any parent information that is required. If you get hung up or confused about a question, the Help and Hints box on the right-hand side of the application can help with each question as you move along. Also, look for the online chat feature under Help if you would like assistance from a knowledgeable agent. Because colleges and career schools use the FAFSA to provide financial aid, you can list up to 10 schools that you are interested in attending. You should list all of the schools that you are considering, even if you haven't been accepted or applied yet. If you have more than 10 schools in mind, you can submit your FAFSA with 10 schools and then replace some of those schools with other schools later. When you finish filling out the FAFSA, use your FSA ID to sign the form. If you are required to submit parent information on your FAFSA, a parent will need to sign the application with his or her own FSA ID as well. If you have any questions or need more information, please visit studentaid.gov. Your child is filling out the FAFSA form and needs your information. What can you expect? The Free Application for Federal Student Aid, or FAFSA form, is the student's, but your information as the parent may be required. Before you start, you will need an FSA ID. The FSA ID is a username and password. If you don't already have an FSA ID, go to studentaid.gov slash FSA ID to make one. Make your own FSA ID and do not share it with your child or anyone else. Be sure to include an email address or mobile phone number you will have access to in the future. In case you lock your account or forget your password, your child needs his or her own FSA ID. Do not create or use your child's FSA ID. Doing so can cause problems with your child's application. 
Now you're ready to work on the FAFSA form. Go to fafsa.gov and select the Start Here button. Make sure your web browser allows pop-up windows from fafsa.ed.gov. If you are starting the application, select the I am a parent option and provide the requested information. Next, create a save key. The save key is a temporary password that lets you 1. Save the application if you need to come back later and 2. Share the application with your child if you aren't completing the form together. Unlike the FSA ID, the save key is meant to be shared between you and your child. If your child starts the FAFSA form, you will pick up where your child left off. Log in with the student's identifiers and use the save key your child created. Help is available for every FAFSA question. You may be able to use your FSA ID to import your tax information directly into your child's FAFSA form using the IRS Data Retrieval Tool. Once you and your child have entered all the required information, you will both need to sign. Follow the directions on the Sign and Submit page. Be sure to sign in the Parent Signature section. Once both of you have signed, be sure to submit the FAFSA form. Your child's FAFSA form is not submitted until you see the confirmation page. Congratulations! Your child's FAFSA form is submitted. The schools listed will use the FAFSA information and other information to determine what aid your child may be eligible to receive. You can always check the status of an application by logging in at fafsa.gov. Students have to submit a FAFSA form every year, so keep track of your FSA ID. Need more info? Visit studentaid.gov slash FAFSA help. So, you filled out the FAFSA. Now what? The information you submitted will be processed by the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Federal Student Aid, and the colleges or career schools you listed will be notified so they can begin their process of awarding aid. The great thing about filling out the FAFSA online is that you can check its processing status immediately. This comes in handy when you're thinking, I wonder if it went through. Within a few days of filling out the FAFSA, you'll get your Student Aid Report, or SAR. You'll hear that abbreviation again, so just remember, your SAR is your Student Aid Report. Basically, it summarizes all of the information you submitted on the FAFSA. You can access your SAR online at fafsa.gov using your FSA ID, which is your username and password. Check your SAR for any mistakes. Then make corrections if you need to, but only if you estimated your tax information or provided incorrect information the day you filled out the FAFSA. On your SAR, you'll see reference to your EFC, or Expected Family Contribution. This number is used to determine your eligibility for federal student aid. It doesn't mean you actually have to contribute that amount. The financial aid office at each college or career school you list on your FAFSA will receive your information. Each office will then use your FAFSA information to determine how much aid you can get at that school. It's possible that your college or career school may require you to verify the information you submitted on your FAFSA. If that happens, your school will tell you what you need to do. Once you're accepted into a college or career school, you'll get an award letter from the school's financial aid office that explains the aid being offered to you. We'd recommend comparing award letters from multiple schools. That way you can make the best decision for your situation. If you have any questions about your financial aid offer, contact the school's financial aid office. If your aid offer includes a federal loan and you're a first-time borrower, there are a few more steps before you get your loan. You'll need to complete entrance counseling and sign the Master Promissory Note, or MPN, which is your agreement to pay back the loan. Your school will provide you with the necessary information. So how do you get your money? Well, usually your grants and loans will be applied to tuition, fees, and other charges on your student account first. Then any leftover money is paid to you. Work-study funds are earned throughout the term. Remember, filling out the FAFSA is not a one-time thing. You must complete it every year you attend school. If you have questions or need more information, please visit studentaid.gov.
Welcome to this financial aid workshop brought to you by the Kappa Alpha Psi Foundation of Maryland and the Alliance for Southern Prince George's Communities. Also, we would like to welcome members of both Flowers High School and Friendly High School PTA. So thank you for joining us today. To those that are also joining us live, give a shout out of your school in the live chat. During this webinar, you will use the chat feature for comments and the Q&A feature for questions. Your questions will be answered live from our panelists. And if you're watching on demand, contact information will be shared with you at the very end. Today's financial aid workshop will focus on how to graduate from college with no debt. Well, we'll discuss how you can do it with as little debt as possible, but at least that should be everyone's goal, right? With $1.6 trillion owed in student loan today in the US, we want to share with you how to start your journey off knowing the necessary information. We'll explore all of those possibilities with our distinguished panelists. In addition to identifying different types of financial aid, uh, we're going to start with what you need to know about FAFSA, even discuss overall liter financial literacy, and we want to help you to determine whether to select a college or a university by cost and provide you with all the resources you need for your success on this journey. But first, let's hear from our presidents of our two participating PTAs, Crystal Carpenter and Chris Lewis. Again, thank you for joining us today. Welcome Charles Herbert Flowers High School parents, students, teachers, and staff to this very informative financial aid webinar hosted by the Kappa Alpha Psi Foundation of Maryland. Hope you learn a lot on this webinar that will help your families um, alleviate some of the financial burdens that oftentimes they encounter when sending their loved one off to college. Good evening. My name is Chris Lewis. I'm the president of the Friendly High School Patriot Parent Teacher Student Association. And welcome to the college tuition financial aid briefing with uh, our local colleges. Thank you both. And now let's get started and begin with the end in mind. Do you really want your child to leave school with a lot of debt? Well, of course not. And as a matter of fact, the amount of debt weighs on all of us more ways than one. Let's take a look at Jasmine McDuffie's experience. She shared her journey on BET's Young, Gifted and Broke segment. I've always done what I was supposed to do, follow the rules, go to school, get the job, so you can have a nice life. Okay, and we're off. Yeah. You can't drive. You can't drive, right. I went to one of the best colleges on earth, Spelman College, and unfortunately accumulated a lot of debt while there. My parents made too much money for government loans, so we were directed to the private loan sector. It has literally been a nightmare. I owe them $176,287.73. I have never shared that number with anyone because it is embarrassing. In nine years, I've not missed a payment. I have variable interest private loans uh, through Sally Mae. I work two full-time nursing jobs. Um, I'm a labor and delivery nurse at two separate hospitals. I'm just work home. Parker, Parker, work home. When I got married, there was really no verbal arrangement. This is my debt and I was gonna pay it. That particular bill added a lot of financial stress to our marriage. I am not currently married anymore. I am making it happen and I am doing it by myself financially. I have been a teacher and I'm currently a nurse. Both of those areas of work afford people who've worked for X amount of years loan forgiveness. I am not able to receive that because I have private loans. It is the exact same loan company that other people are getting their loans forgiven through because of the word private. They're untouchable. You can't consolidate them. You can't send in income-based repayment uh, documentation. I will be 63 when my last payment is made. I went to school for, what, to pay it back for the rest of my life? I can't get out of it. I don't know where to go for help. It is disheartening to know that the number is definitely gonna go up in December because I will then be out of interest only payments. $1,800 a month is more than my current mortgage. If you're not in a place to get the full rides, the government funding, 
you are in a place to set yourself up for a trap. So again, we just want to um, hone in and we just wanted to hear from McDuffie's experience, really here to discuss how to graduate from college with no debt or how you can do it with as little debt as possible. We have over two decades of experience in assisting others in their journey. First is Ms. Danielle Davis. She is a financial aid coordinator at Bowie State University with a decade of wealth of knowledge on regulations and processing financial literacy. Um, originally hailing from Anchorage, Alaska, Ms. Davis really attended Bowie State University where she obtained a, a bachelor's of science in communications and a master's in organizational communications as well. Really her passion is in assisting students and instilling the importance of education. So she's gonna be joining us today as part of our distinguished panelists. Next is Mr. Earl Johnson. He's an educational specialist at the University of Maryland Educational Opportunity Center, where he provides academic, personal, uh, and, and career counseling to both adults and young people in the Prince George's County area. He also works with first-generation potential college students young people and adults who are looking to enroll in colleges and universities across the state and, and across the country. And he received his BS um, from Morgan State University and his master's in education from Towson University. In his current role at the University of Maryland College Park, Mr. Johnson believes that a solid education will challenge our beliefs and question our presuppositions. And lastly, we have Ms. Jamelia Parson. She is a financial aid counselor at the University of Maryland College Park within the Office of Student Financial Aid. So she is a graduate of Howard University with a bachelor's degree in psychology, minor in business administration, and also earned her MA, MBA um, from the University of Maryland Global Campus. Uh, she has a decade of experience helping college students to understand and navigate through the federal aid process by way of the FAFSA application, the state of Maryland grant funding, and a myriad of, of, of other scholarships, if you will, funding opportunities, as well as financial literacy. In addition to her financial aid background, she has over 13 years working at a financial banking institutions, managing several branch locations. Again, thank you all for agreeing to share this information, necessary information, and advice with parents and students on this platform. So let's begin with our first segment. And this is gonna to relate to our overall topic, how to graduate from college with no debt. So I want to address the first question head on, if you let me do so, right? So Mr. Earl Johnson, is it even a reality to graduate from college with no debt? Uh, yes, ma'am, it is a reality to graduate from college with little to no debt, as we like to say. Um, but in reality, in order for a student, um, a young person to graduate from school with little to no debt, they have to approach um, going to school with, from the perspective that the school that you wanna go to may not necessarily be the school that you need to go to. Um, I believe strongly that choosing the right college should not be an emotional decision, mm -hmm. but it should be an educated decision. It should be a wise decision and it should be a logical decision. So in addition to it being emotional, there's a lot of college costs that we have to consider. And what are some of the current college debt statistics, if you will? Jamila, can you share with us what, what's going on on behalf of a national front? Sure, absolutely. So currently, um, the national student loan debt is reported as of June 2019 as roughly around $1.6 trillion. So that's a lot of debt that's out there. And it's important for us not to have debt. Um, wh why is that important for us, Danielle? If you can just kind of share with us, because I know, again, it, it affects people more than just out of their pockets. But why is not having debt so important? Not having a debt or little to no debt when graduating will help students and families in many ways. The first is that debt upon graduation puts an added strain um, and pressure on students and families to have to pay those funds back, considering that most federal loans go into repayment six months after the student 
graduates from school if they decide not to uh, continue their education or further their degrees. Also, in this unprecedented time with a pandemic going on and the uncertainty of the economy, job security, it's just so much pressure um, in addition to the family unit having to occur debt um, and that being a sense of credit in the long run that will also show up on big ticket items. So, and I know um, Mr. Johnson expressed a little bit about um, choosing colleges and university. Um, Ms. Parsons, can you share with us why school choice is so important to, to these parents and these students? Yeah, absolutely. That's an ex excellent question. Um, a student's uh, school choice is extremely important. Students need to consider if their college or university is not only a fit academically, but also financially. From the financial perspective, you always want to know how much your education will cost you to attend the desired, you know, university that you that you want to um, to attend over a four year period of time and maybe sometimes even, even longer, just depending on your study or program. And that's because the longer you stay in school, perhaps the more loans and more debts you, you, debt you'll get into, correct? Yes, correct. Gotcha, okay. So I know that we were talking about um, uh, scholarships and grants and how all that's wrapped into it. Are there enough scholarships and grants available for the average student who, uh, with parents that have high incomes, um, anyone want to share that? Danielle, would you like to, to share about that? Sure, no problem. Um, there are so many resources and scholarships out there. As long as the families are willing to put in the work um, and to stay on top of deadlines and utilize the many different avenues, it is very possible. However, that understanding needs to be made not just with the parents, but also the students, that they have an obligation as well to help invest in their future and in their education. Um, I am a, a, a prime example. I only had to take out one student loan in my entire four years of undergraduate. Um, and it's because I was diligent. I was on top of things. Yes, I did work several jobs as well, but it's not an instantaneous thing always that you're going to get a scholarship. You have to work for it. The students have to keep their grades up. There's a lot of researching that is involved because millions of students are trying, all trying to go for that same pot of funds. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's definitely important for them to, to share the weight of it, if you will, put some skin in the game, I hear you, okay. Um, even um, talking about them putting skin in the game and getting some well, how important is it for the student to take on responsibility um, by working part time, for example? Mr. Johnson, can you share about that, about that, that whole role that the student has to play there? Well, that, that's a very good question. And to answer your question directly, um, work for students, especially freshmen, um, a first year college student working part time has, can have its pros and its cons. It can be a good thing and it can be a not so good thing. Um, I'm a strong believer that every student um, should um, take some sort of investment or, or participate into their own college costs. Um, and with that being um, the case, many young people will opt to work part-time jobs here and there. I myself, I was one of those individuals. I worked full-time and I went to school full-time while I was an undergraduate student. Um, sometimes working can be beneficial to the student simply because it allows him or her to realize the responsibility of paying for things such as books, uh, paying for things such as um, equipment and a laptop computer, so forth and so on, that they may need to take certain classes um, as far as their college matriculation is concerned. Now, me, myself, I worked for an organization. I worked part-time for an organization that helped with my college um, tuition costs. So in my case, it was beneficial for me to work part-time when I worked for part-time and move into working full-time and going to school at the same time. Gotcha. And um, even Ms. Davis, is it, could you share and expound upon that, that issue about how students need to take more of a responsibility and whatever role they take, whatever part-time or full-time job they have? Because we've heard the conversation 
amongst parents to say, you know, they're taking the brunt of all of this, but, you know, sometimes the students need to step up with it, right? Yes, most definitely, um, because it does need to be a, a decision that is weighed in from all family members or for the parents and the student or the student and the spouse, depending on their circumstance. So it does help with the support system as well. Um, and as it does help the, the student gain working knowledge and also responsibility. A lot of students in college lack time management skills. Mm -hmm. And th those are things that also can be assisted with with a job. Beautiful. Um, even Ms. Parsons, I know that, you know, we don't want to overwhelm any of the parents with all this information and all these resources, but what criteria would you recommend um, that parents or students use when comparing financial aid packages uh, between multiple schools? Because some schools may offer customized packages, if you will. What, what type of strategy would you give them? Um, well, again, like you were saying, it varies depending on the college or university. Some of the schools may offer a larger incentive package to incoming freshman students where others may not have the same type of funding that they can offer. And understanding that award package um, will not look the same across the different universities that your student applies to. So ideally, the school that provides the most funding option and generally that's maybe scholarships and or grants. And it could also comprise of some federal loans and some federal um, grants if they do qualify for those um, other need-based type funding. Um, you, you, they just wanna make sure that they have a more affordable financial solution um, you know, within their household to reduce as little debt as possible. So definitely just looking at the awarding options that they do receive and like Mr. Johnson was indicating, sometimes the school that you want to go to may not be the school that you need to go to. Gotcha. And I'm even thinking about what we were just mentioning here about whether you work full-time or whether you work part-time. Um, is there any way or what are, what are the options that, say for example, I'm a student and I wanna start paying off my debt while I am in school. Uh, is there any way that I can take some of that debt and begin to pay um, off these student loans while I'm in school. Ms. Davis, can you share about that? If you, if you have some information on, on experiences coming into your office about that? Yes, definitely. Students can start paying on their loans while in school. Um, a, big, a big understanding that students may not get, especially as freshmen, is that student loans have interest. Um, only some loans are those interests deferred or incurred by the federal government. So loans that have interest on top of what they're already borrowing, those numbers are going to double and triple by the time, if they wait until the end of their uh, schooling to start paying those back. So yes, most definitely students can start repaying on their loans, even if, even if it's just as small as something as the interest. Also, um, students and families need to know that loans can be, um, if they get a scholarship late, then those loans can be adjusted. Just because you decide that you wanna take out maybe a student loan for the academic year, if they get a late award, adjustments can be made to the loans um, after the fact. So that is also good information for families to know that everything necessarily isn't set in stone. If you get a, an additional scholarship that may be able to take off some of the brunt of a loan in, in the following semester. Beautiful. So again, that segment was really just talking about how to graduate from college um, with no debt. And now I wanna transition a little bit, you all. I wanna transition to the different types of financial aid. Um, and again, there, you know, whether there's debt involved or no debt involved, I want to start first with the debt-free stuff, right? So if you could, um, Ms. Parsons, just explain to us a little bit about, um, from your experience, the different types of debt-free um, financial aid, uh, whether it be in, in grants. Let's, go, let's start there. Let's start with grants. What can you share with us about um, debt-free types of grants? Sure. Um, 
There are many grant opportunities out there. However, the Department of Education only offers three different types of grants. All three are considered need-based, meaning that through the FAFSA application, the student has to show need for additional financial assistance when paying for their post-secondary education. The student, needs to de um, the student need is determined by the reported expected family contribution or EFC. There are three grants that are offered and the EFC range and to qualify for those grants as a, as a, as a following, excuse me. Um, so for the federal Pell Grant, a student's EFC needs to be between zero to 5,711. The SCOG grant, um, which is the supplemental grant that the Department of Education offers, the stupid, I'm sorry, the student typically qualifies for their grants with an automatic zero EFC. That means that when the FAFSA application is submitted, the initial EFC is zero. The other grant that is offered is the federal work study and the EFC range generally is between zero to 8,000, which some colleges and university may make an exception with that, but the general range is between zero to 8,000. Lastly, um, not offered by the federal government, but some states may offer grant funding. Um, and for those who live and attend a qualifying college or university within that state, the state of Maryland has a dedicated office um, that's called the Maryland Higher Education Commission or MHAC for short, offers um, state grants to students who are need-based eligible, meaning that they do have to submit a FAFSA application to initially qualify for it. They do have to have an EFC range um, that also um, makes them eligible for that particular grant from, from the state of Maryland. The program is called MD CAPS and they offer two op grant opportunities, which is the Guarantee Access Grant and the Educational Assistance Grant. Um, Maryland resident students can also search for, or Maryland resident students who are not um, US citizens can also uh, apply through the state of Maryland through the MISFA application where they may potentially be eligible to receive some sort of funding from the state of Maryland. And lastly, uh, the delegate and or senator scholar or senatorial scholarship, uh, students can seek out their delegate or senator in their region to see what type of scholarships or grants that they can offer to them as well. Perfect, Ms. Parsons, and I'm only saying that because on behalf of being a parent and even growing up, I had no idea there was any other types, <laughs> any other types of grants. All I just remember is Pell Grants myself. So I'm glad we're able to inform all of our parents and our students the different types of um, financial aid that are out there. Even Ms. Davis, there's a difference between um, some of these funding. So how are scholarships and aid different? Can you share that with us? Yes, so scholarships are different from other types of aid, whereas scholarships are generally free funds that do not have to be paid back. However, most scholarships have some set of criteria um, that has to be adhered to, whether it's major base, GPA, a certain amount of credits each semester. There's a lot of different stipulations that scholarships can be awarded by. And it's important for families and for students when they receive a scholarship to know what those stipulations are so that the students know what to do to potentially keep getting that scholarship and know what not to do. Um, so there's a difference as, um, Ms. Jamila said that there's a difference between need-based financial aid, which can, comes off of the information from the FAFSA application versus other different types of scholarships, such as let's say maybe a church scholarship. So those are coming from different um, resources, from different types of um, places. So it is good to know um, all of the different stipulations or criterias for students to get scholarships and know that there are many scholarships for every different type of situation, um, whether it be local or national. 
Gotcha. So you you were mentioning those. So there's really a, a state category, an institutional category, a private category, and any any particular benefits or funds that you can get on behalf of being in the military, correct? Yes, so there are, yes, there are all different categories that scholarships and even maybe grants can come through in each of those types of um, resources. Beautiful. And, and Mr. Johnson, you mentioned how you worked full time while you were in school. Um, what about work study as another form of debt free financial aid? Well, um, work study um, uh, funds that a student can acquire that um, is monies, monies that comes to a student, not necessarily that the student puts in his or her pocket, mm -hmm. but it's monies that the, that the school would put on their student aid balance or student account balance. So actually, um, just to give you my um, small testimony, I actually started in admissions, college admissions through a work study um, position. I was an admissions office, officer's assistant. And I actually got paid to help out in the office of admissions. And for the hours that I put in, they used that money. I didn't see the money, but they actually used it to put towards my college tuition um, cost. Um, so with that being the case, I think when students fill out the FAFSA, many students will omit the question that says, would you like to be considered for work study? That's an automatic yes um, to me. I think every student um, should, check, should check that off. So, yeah. Okay. And I know, again, that was the debt-free portion. We got to move here. We got to move into the debt portion. So this is this is what we don't want or certainly want to minimize, um, but we know that there are some um, viable um, options in doing so. Um, can we start off with, I know we have to go here, but let's, let's start off with the loans. So Ms. Parsons, can you share with us about explaining some of the loans um, on behalf of uh, financial aid? Sure, so um, just briefly, what loans are, are simply what they are. There's, there are funds that are on loan. And these are borrowed amounts that must be paid back. And if students borrow funds from the Department of Education, um, they do offer loan funding to students to help pay for their post-secondary education. The loan funding, in order for students to be eligible for it, they must be enrolled in a minimum of at least six credits or a half-time enrollment, depending on the college or university that the student is attending. Um, uh, to be eligible for, again, that loan disbursement. Another requirement for the federal loans are the interest counseling that must be completed before any federal loans can be given or used. And also the master promissory note um, has to be on file at that institution that the student is attending before any of that uh, loan, federal loan disbursements can take place. And We've mentioned it before, other various types of loans uh, are private loan funding um, from a multitude of different um, commercial or private lenders that offer educational loans. And I know that for our parents, that this is their first time beginning on this journey. Um, some of these words and phrases that perhaps we're saying is new to them. Um, so uh, Ms. Davis, can you share with our parents and our students about federal subsidized loans perhaps, or um, federal unsubsidized loans, just to kind of you know school them on those particular um, terms. Yes, no problem. So the federal government generally offers students two different types of loans in their name when they apply for the FAFSA application. The two different types of student loans are the subsidized loan and the unsubsidized loan. The difference between the two is that the interest occurs while the student is in school on the unsubsidized loan. The subsidized loan is also considered a need-based loan. So that information is awarded from the, from the government to the school, to the student, based upon their, their answers on the FAFSA. And that's the subsidized. So the subsidized is the better of the two loans if a student or parents wanted to choose, um, deciding if which are the better of the two loans. Okay. But both are in the student's name and 
both can be used to help pay for college. Gotcha. And Mr. Johnson, share with us about this PLUS loan. We've been hearing about that. And I know some parents are, are on that journey ahead of obtaining you know, uh, the PLUS loan. What is the PLUS loan? Well, um, the PLUS loan is a loan that the parent um, can take out or a loan that's offered to the parent by the, by the school on, on, on the behalf of the student. Usually, um, parents are offered Parent PLUS loans when the financial aid award amount doesn't quite meet the, um, the student, the, the total cost of attending um, a particular institution. Um, we do, I do know that the Parent PLUS loan is based on us, the parent's credit um, rating. It's a loan that's, that's in the parent's name and not the student's um, name. And it's just another way that parents can help out with the um, total college tuition costs um, on the behalf of their young person. Gotcha, okay. And I, I wanted to get into um, perhaps talking about um, savings on behalf of having a payment plan and uh, the parent's ability to do so even um, sharing with the, the parents about planning and preparing for college um, altogether. And I know that there's some outside scholarships uh, Mr. Johnson can be able to share with us. Um, so if you have any questions concerning those particular areas, please make sure you ask those into the Q&A chat and we will definitely cover that. But I wanna move into um, the FAFSA, the free application for student aid. Um, and I know that there are a lot of information perhaps you may see online about the FAFSA, um, but I wanted to kind of hone in on some of the highlights, meaning there's some important timelines and maybe there's some timelines that are unique to each institution, to each college or university. Uh, Ms. Parsons, can you share a little bit about um, um, just getting on this whole FAFSA uh, journey? Because there's a lot to, to kind of delve into, but just kind of give us some highlights about some of the important timelines on behalf of FAFSA. Sure, so all students need to be extremely mindful of all the timelines pertaining to the FAFSA application, state, state grant eligibility, early admission to the university, um, the university priority deadlines, merit, merit awarding and financial, uh, I'm sorry, admission confirmation. So some of these timelines are very specific to each school and missing a deadline date could mean missing out on potential grant or, or, and or scholarship that um, they will no longer have the opportunity to receive again. So the student and all, also parent needs to make sure that with any and all universities that they apply to or in, in interested in that they review this information. So I know for College Park, we do have specific timelines. Um, November 1st, is the deadline date for incoming freshman students for early admission. Um, and of course, uh, October 1st is the opening date of the FAFSA application each academic aid year for the next year. Um, the priority deadline for our office is January 1st for in-state students to potentially qualify for some grant funding that we may be able to offer to them. Um, and merit is at the same time when students apply to the university, but it's through early admission. Um, and also the confirmation deadline, and that's students confirming that they plan to attend the university, which the national deadline date is generally May 1st. Um, and, and then one more uh, for the Maryland State Grant um, opportunities, the deadline date is March 1st. And of course, again, missing these dates mean that you won't have the opportunity to, again, to um, be reconsidered for that aid, for that academic aid year. Okay. So I just want to stop here and remind all the parents, it looks like you need to get a, a, a scheduler, <laughs> a calendar, um, really for each student you have in your household, graduating senior, on behalf of all of these deadlines, set it up in your Google calendar, whatever you need to do, right? Um, so that they can be reminded of such. And even as a parent, it's a lot to deal with and a lot to remember. Um, I was told that, you know, filling out the fast was like doing your taxes all over again. It's like, you know, signing up for a mortgage all over again, but it's our first stop. So uh, Ms. Davis, can you share with us why do we have to fill out the FAFSA application? 
Is it a must? (laughs) Well, you would be surprised of how many families actually are discouraged from completing the FAFSA application. And I'm here today to let you know that any family that wants to be considered for any type of assistance, and schools really do want to help, we want to help you guys. So in order to do that, you must complete the FAFSA application for any type of, to be considered for any type of federal, institutional, state, and sometimes even private aid is based on the answers and the the information that comes off of the FAFSA. So even though it may be a little daunting, once you get the hang of it, especially because you need to complete the FAFSA application for each year that you're requesting financial assistance. No, once- it's not. I thought it was a one-time deal, mm-hmm. right? No, not one time. <laughs> it's once a year. So um, once you get the hang of it, it won't be that bad, that daunting. Um, but that first time, just take your time. There are a lot of tools and resources on the actual application when you're filling it out. And the great thing about the FAFSA is that you can save it if you have questions and you can come back to it. It's not going anywhere. So yes, take your time, be patient, and it will have its rewards. Gotcha. Okay. So parents, I know you're, you're, you're watching this. So give yourself some grace, <laughs> give yourself some patience in doing so. Even in filling out the FAFSA, uh, Ms. Parsons, can you share with us if there are any special circumstances dealing with the FAFSA application? Ah, the million dollar question that all <laughs> parents want to do. So um, there is what's called a professional judgment or special circumstances appeal that a college or university can look into. Now, the, the, the understanding of it is that the, the federal government does put out there that these different colleges and universities can do what's called a special circumstances appeal, but not all colleges and universities participate in it. So, um, you know, you may have something that's going on in your household that originally the information that you had listed on your FAFSA application, it has changed, such as, um, you know, loss of income, loss of employment, or a death of a parent um, in the household are some of the considerations that can be looked at. Um, But then also keeping in mind that not everything can be looked at, only specific information or certain circumstances can be reviewed um, to make these changes. So um, it is possible given, you know, one of those circumstances, for example, a parent had um, uh, sometime during a year had lost their uh, their job and they no longer have any income Mm -hmm. um, that is considered to be a special circumstances where um, a student who may not have previously been eligible for any need-based federal aid or any outside need-based aid before that with the special circumstances appeal, when we review it, it can change their EFC. And this review only reviews for federal aid eligibility where it could potentially award them uh, Pell Grant funding and also qualify them for any other outside need-based aid that they could potentially um, apply for and receive. Uh, Another note is that oftentimes, you know, we, in our office, we do get a lot of appeals um, and there are circumstances that do warrant, um, you know, a second review, but not all cases do result in a student receiving any additional federal aid, such as the Pell Grant, or even um, the the EFC may be lowered, but not lowered enough to where the student can receive need-based aid. So that's something, you know, very important to also keep in mind because they do the appeal and automatically think that because of their circumstances, they are guaranteed is not a guarantee. Gotcha. Okay. And I know for those parents that they do have this, um, all of these timelines embedded into the family calendar, they're trying to be proactive. Um, so let's say that I'm a parent and I want to apply early. Will students receive any AIDS offers earlier if they apply earlier? Mr. Johnson, what's the, what's the million dollar question to that? 
Uh, that's a very good question. And I, and I get asked that question all the time. What, what happens basically with financial aid, um, and, and basically it's a chain of command. Financial aid usually does not kick in or, or an offer doesn't take place until and unless the student has been admitted to whatever institution he or she is going to attend. Now, um, admissions, a lot of admissions offices have monies that they will offer to a student in merit scholarships, but that has nothing to do with what goes on in the Office of Financial Aid. For example, if you have a young person who's applying to, let's say, a Morgan State University or a Coppin State or University of Baltimore, and this young person has a cumulative GPA of about a 3.5, admissions officers are able to award that young person a small merit scholarship based on his or her academic standing. But most institutions and or most universities will not even put together a financial aid packet until that young person has been admitted to um, the school. So with that being the case, to answer your question, I don't care how early you complete your FAFSA, how soon you um, complete your FAFSA, usually nothing will not happen until he or she, your young person has been admitted to whatever institution he or she is gonna to go to. Great information. And again, pick that parents, whatever your questions are, please um, ask those questions in the Q&A feature. Um, any comments you would like to make, please place those in the chat um, feature as well. This is some great information, great resources. And even let's say that I'm ready. I've got my calendar together. Um, Mr. Johnson just answered the question about if I apply early, will I get um, funds early? How do I apply? I'm ready to go, Ms. Davis. What do I need to do first? So the, the biggest two ways to complete your FAFSA is either one, online, at www.studentaid.gov, or the simplest way is to download the My Student Aid app right on your smartphone. Both you, the student, and the parent can complete it right on the smart app. Perfect. All right. And Mr. Johnson, again, I know we've got a lot of great questions on behalf of um, parents and uh, a lot of conversation that is taking place amongst the parents. Um, does dependency status make a difference when I'm when I'm doing this whole FAFSA? Um, um, dependent dependency status um, does make a difference because dependency status can practically determine um, what your EFC um, number will be. Also, it can also determine how much financial aid you will be eligible for. Um, there are two types of dependency status, either you're an independent student or you are a dependent um, student. In order to be a, a, an independent student, one of the things that has changed since I was in undergraduate school, you have to be 24 years of age or older or have a child of your own, be married or be an active duty in the military. If you don't fall, fall under one of those categories, you are considered a dependent student. So a lot of times students who are 21, 22 years of age who work a full-time job, they want to know, one of their questions is, why do I have to use my parents' income? Why do I have to report my parents' income on my FAFSA? The reason why is because until you turn 24 years of age, you're still considered uh, uh, a dependent student unless you fall under one of the categories that I just named. And, and Mr. Johnson, stay right there with me because I got to stay here. Um, you mentioned about parents and um, filling out the FAFSA. 51% of our nation is in, uh, is in a blended family mode, if you will, okay? So is there a special scenario on behalf of divorced parents? Is there something different that they have to do when filling out the FAFSA? Well, actually, um, I believe the rule says, and uh, Ms. Jamillion, correct me if I'm wrong, um, whatever parent is providing at least 51% of the young person's care, that's the parent whose information should be reported on um, the FAFSA. So if you are a young person and you are in a, a blended family, um, your mom or dad has remarried, um, his or her spouse's information needs to go on um, to um, the FAFSA. And Ms. Parsons, did you want to... Um... Uh, add any more to that? 
yeah, so absolutely what Mr. Johnson has stated, that is um, correct. So in oftentimes students that uh, submit their FAFSA applications to our office, they tend to put both biological parents on their FAFSA applications, but their biological parents are no longer together or were, um, you know, or never married or don't live in the same household. So the rule is, um, as Mr. Johnson stated, the parent that you're living with that provides more than 51% of your support, if they are now remarried, um, that other spouse must be included on the FAFSA application. The FAFSA application or the Department of Ed wants um, to know as of the date that the FAFSA application is being completed. So that's the first day that you open it and you start that application. What is the overall understanding of your entire financial um, and household information? So if you're in the household with your mom and your mom is married, your mom is married. That means that both your mom and your step parent must be included on that FAFSA application. Beautiful. And thank you for sharing that because I know that's a, it can be real touchy. It can be real iffy in a lot of households. So that this is some real world stuff, <laughs> real world wisdom that you all are offering today. So even let me go back to the, the FAFSA ap application itself. There's something that is called the SAR, the Student Aid Report. Uh, Ms. Ms. Davis, can you share a little bit about um, explaining the SAR or the SAR to us and to the parents? Absolutely. So the SAR report or the student aid report is um, just a summary of the answers that have been put or entered onto the, app, the FAFSA application. So it's very important once you've completed, the family and the student has completed that FAFSA application to review it, to make sure that there are no errors because all of that information is going to the schools that have been placed on the, the FAFSA. So a, a student can list up to 10 different schools to receive this application. And so we're going to get those answers and those responses. So it's very important to review that SAR report to make sure that there are no errors or what we call, it's a snapshot. If you were to take a picture of your, of your family and their situation as of the day that you complete the FAFSA, it's a snapshot of what you're reporting. Um, and that SAR report will also give you that EF See that estimated family contribution, which each school uses to award the student, it will also have an estimate on how much the federal government will be awarding the student based upon those answers, as well as it will let the families know if they need to prepare some documents that will need to go to these schools so that they can start getting those items together. And again, this is all on the FAFSA um, online application as well. So whether it be SAR, the student aid report, there's something that is also called the EFC, the expected family contribution. But I wanna hone in very quickly before we move into our, our next topic and, and talking about financial literacy. There's something that is, um, whether it be SAR or e EFC, um, those things are on the fast road. There's something perhaps maybe unique to the county that we live in. So is PG County unique, uh, Mr. Johnson, to um, some of these different um, features on the FAFSA application? Um, I, I would not say that Prince George's County is unique to some of the features on um, the FAFSA application. Of course, they're gonna um, ask what county do you live in? Where do you live, the state, um, city, so forth and so on. Um, I don't believe that there's anything unique to PG County that's on the actual FAFSA um, application, but PG County is unique in and of itself when it comes down to the student completing um, the MD CAPS account for his or her specific jurisdiction. Gotcha. Okay, beautiful. Um, and um, while we're there too, Mr. Johnson, I know we were talking about um, parents' income. Um, are there income limits to um, qualifying for financial aid? 
I don't believe there are any income limits to qualifying for financial aid. Um, I think it's based on household composition, how many people live in the household, how many students are currently in college, how many students may be on um, their way um, to college. Um, you can be a household that makes $200,000 a year, but you can have five kids in college. So I would not specifically say that there's an income limit to those who would qualify for financial aid. Okay, gotcha. All right. So again, for all of our parents that are um, on this journey for the first time, whether you have one student in your household, or maybe you have multiple uh, students in your household, we want to be able to kind of hone in with you uh, and learn and, and show and share all this wisdom. So we've talked about, again, at the very beginning about, you know, how can I get my student um, through college, how can they graduate from college without any debt? We talked about the different types of um, financial aid, even um, hone in a little bit, give us some highlights on behalf of the FAFSA. So um, even getting on this journey, you all, we have to know some type of basic foundation about finances, right? So uh, Ms. Parsons, can you share with us a little bit about how much of a loan to use? Uh, again, perhaps this is maybe the first time people or even the students at the age of 17 and 18 um, really are signing up for a loan of, you know, what is that all, you know, encounter for them? So how much of a loan um, should a, a student, uh, should a parent um, use when we're talking about financial literacy? Well, you know, as a financial aid counselor, I can't really tell a student and or parent how much loan that they should be using. However, from a a standpoint of just understanding that a loan is considered to be a debt and a debt that must be repaid, then you should only consider what you need and not necessarily use over what you need because borrowing more means that um, more accumulated interest and more that you have to pay down once it comes you know, due to pay. So uh, there are some families that just cannot avoid using loans. Um, I, I've seen it many times. Um, they don't qualify for any need-based funding. The household income, uh, the parents, they make too much and just don't qualify for anything, uh, any, any need-based aid. I mean, definitely looking for other scholarship opportunities, as Ms. Davis has mentioned before, um, other scholarships that don't look at the criteria of need-based, but looking at merit, community service, sports, the type of activities that you're involved in, um, looking for those type of scholarships, those uh, students who are out of the need-based range um, can use, um, but definitely only using loans if you need to. And again, there's some families that just can only use loans to pay for their post-secondary education, but only using the amount of the loan that you need. And that's to specifically budget and look at your tuition and fee costs because that's what you need to pay to the university. Housing, if you're staying on campus um, versus being a commuter, where being a commuter, you know, if you're within commutable distance from the university can help minimize some of those costs and not necessarily needing to use all the loans. So these are just some tips that I often tell students and parents when it comes to using, you know, any federal loan or private loans for that matter. Perfect. And even uh, Ms. Davis, can you expound upon that a little bit about what, what do parents need to know about savings and budgeting uh, since uh, Ms. Parsons mentioning about, about budgeting there? Yes, there are so many things to take into consideration um, when starting this journey. The first um, tip that I generally give parents and students is that you need to know that college is an investment. Um, just like buying a house or a car, many people plan to make these big ticket items and there's no difference with college. Uh, so there are millions of of students applying for the same financial aid and funding sometimes can be limited. So it's good for parents to have a um, basis and make decisions um, such as a Maryland 529 um, tuition plan 
or, or savings, as well as most institutions also have some type of payment plan where if you decide not to use a loan, that there can be installments made um, on a monthly basis versus maybe taking out a loan. Um, so these are all good tips for parents and families to understand. And budgeting, as um, Ms. Parsons said, it's not just about tuition and fees. Sometimes it's, uh, there are additional costs, such as books, uh, groceries, if they're going to be you know, commuting back and forth and maybe not having a meal plan, um, which can be a little bit more costly if they're really not utilizing it. Even things such as um, computers, printers, supplies that they will need. And those are above and beyond the just general tuition and fees, which are only going to be for the classes itself. So something to keep in mind, as well as non-traditional semesters that may not also be covered within um, certain financial aid scholarships and grants to help that student further along their process. So they may take off a semester um, out of that four years or shorten that length of time um, that you're going to continue having to pay funds. So also something to keep in mind is if I take on maybe a couple more classes, do I really have to go for that long length of time? Um, so thinking of it as once again, an investment in the long run. So uh, Mr. Johnson, I am in the, the thick of this. I am a student and I need some relief. I need some forgiveness, right? What types of loans could I be eligible for forgiveness? Well, um, to answer your question um, straight to the point, most student loans are eligible for some sort of um, forgiveness. Um, but the question, the question that we really need to ask ourselves or the question that should be asked is what types of forgiveness programs uh, are you going to use or are, what types of forgiveness programs do you qualify uh, mm. for? Um, I myself, when I was an undergraduate student, I qualified for the teacher forgiveness um, program. So for every year that I taught in the public um, school system in a Title I school, um, working with um, low-income students, the government forgave a certain percentage of my student loan. So basically, you, you need to do some research. You can always go to the um, US Department of Education website and they have a, a list of um, forgiveness programs. And you need to look at the different categories and see which one you may um, be eligible for. Okay. And again, to all of our participants and our, our parents and our students, please um, post your questions in the Q&A feature and whatever comments you would like to make in our chat. Um, feature. So we will be, again, waiting to answer those questions for you um, at the very end of this session for those that are joining us live. So we've transitioned from the FAFSA for, from financial literacy. Now I want to go into, as a parent, how do I help my students select um, this college of their choice, their dream college? They've been talking about this since um, they were in junior high or their dream college of where I want them to go because so maybe I want them to go where I went to school. Um, or, you know, perhaps another family member went to school. So let's get into selecting the cost of attending college. Um, and even Ms. Parsons, can you help us share with the, um, our parents, explain the difference in attending in-state versus out-of-state? Let's start there. Well, um, for, for some institutions, the, the difference is generally the cost of the tuition. So for example, um, I can tell you with the University of Maryland, the in-state tuition cost, uh, and this is tuition and fee cost uh, per semester is roughly around uh, maybe $5,400 and uh, you know per semester and that's full time. And one of the great features about uh, UMD is that uh, students who take credits between 12 and 18, um, it's a flat full-time fee rate. So, you know, you can take as, you know, many credits between 12 and 18 and you pay that, you know, that flat full-time fee. Um, out of state, now the tuition cost is much larger than that. And um, so the comparing, comparing the cost of attendance between in-state and out-of-state, so it's roughly around 
I'm overestimating, but around 31,000, between 27 to 31,000 for in-state, and it could range anywhere between um, 53,000 to maybe 55,000 um, for an out-of-state student. And that's the cost of attendance. And of course, the cost of attendance comprises of the tuition fees, room and board, um, transportation, book supplies, and other miscellaneous educational expenses, that's what that total cost of attendance number makes up. So, uh, you know, mentioning budgeting again, you know, you budget within that cost of attendance to know what your expenses are, who you need to pay it to, um, and, you know, whether you're in state or out of state. Uh, if you are in the state of Maryland, state institutions, oftentimes the uh, the tuition rate is a lot lower. So if you're from New Jersey, New, um, New York, because um, UMD has a lot of those students from that area that come down, you're paying out of state. And most of the time those students have an exorbitant uh, cost because they're not only paying the out of state tuition, but they also have to find some place to live in this area, whether it be on campus or you know some off campus housing. So that is an extreme expense that uh, that has to be paid, you know, by those students and our parents. So definitely um, looking at those two different costs when selecting a university. And then another important thing is that uh, some universities. Uh, again, like I, I believe I mentioned earlier, that they do offer uh, different type of incentive packages for students, uh, where um, they may offer some grant or scholarship opportunities, you know, when they do apply to the school. Not all schools are the same. So if your award package at one institution gave you a full ride, but it may not necessarily be the ideal your top school that you want to attend, but your top school that you do want to attend is not offering, offering you a lot, then, you know, the decision comes down to, well, do you want to go to the school that is paying your way mm -hmm. or to a school that you want to go to and, you know, but not necessarily need to go to, but then coming out of that, that uh, school after four years with, you know, a lot of debt. So it's, it's a lot to take into consideration. Gotcha. And again, that was whether I'm deciding on state versus out of state. Um, even there's a conversation in many households about attending state supported versus private. Um, so Ms. Davis, can you share a little bit about that, helping parents to kind of make that decision, make that choice? Yes. So there are a lot of times where we counsel students and families about um, the decisions of state institutions versus private institutions. So when a, a family is deciding about a school, whether to stay in, um, not only just stay in state, but a state supported school, generally we're talking about funds that can assist them with those those costs. And so Maryland Higher Education is a great resource and offers millions of dollars to students, um, Maryland residents to stay in state to piggyback off of Ms. Parsons, um, as well as generally you're having a fixed rate for a state institution. Um, in terms of tuition and fees because they are governed by the University of Maryland system or the state of Maryland um, at, versus a private institution which their tuition and fee costs can vary and fluctuate and they're more heavy towards the endowment side versus other types of funding. So once again, it's great if you receive an award package from a, a, a private institution, but their tuition and fee costs may be extremely more than what a state institution may be. So you really have to look at all of the costs and weigh those costs. And most of the, all institutions should have their costs of attendances located online or accessible so that they can start doing those comparisons now. Gotcha. And, and Mr. Johnson, I know that you mentioned that you have helped all different types of people um, get their higher level of education. Um, and I know we, we can go into community college, but explain and share a little bit about what about attending two-year schools or, or four-year schools? 
Well, there is a benefit to both. Um, there is a benefit um, to attending a two-year institution, um, and there is a benefit to attending a, a four-year institution. Um, the same individuals who teach at the University of Maryland um, also teach at Prince George's Community College and Montgomery Community College. And the same individuals that teach at those institutions also teach at Bowie and or um, the University of Maryland. So there is a benefit um, to go into both institutions. You may be a student who may necess not necessarily wants to earn a bachelor's degree. Maybe you just want to earn a certificate. Maybe you just want, maybe you want to become an EMT, uh, go to a community college, you know, get the certification, so forth and so on, and get right into the work world. Um, but one of the benefits of attending a community college versus, uh, versus a four-year institution, you can, in the state of Maryland, you can easily transfer from community colleges to four-year institutions in state and out of state. Um, uh, many of students don't realize the jewel that they have right in their own backyard by starting at a community college, being able to cut into the cost of going to college and transfer it into a school like a University of Maryland or Bowie State or Morgan, so forth and um, so on. Most of the four-year institutions already have articulation agreements in place with the four-year institutions to make the transfer process um, very easy. Most of the four-year schools just want students to have between 12 and 24 credits, and then they will allow you to transfer. And not only that, you may qualify for transfer um, scholarships. Right, so keep hope alive. There are options, right? Right. <laughs> right. There's money out here. Right. And, and I hope that we have um, just kind of repeated that sentiment all throughout this particular um, session is that, you know, it is possible to have you graduate, um, have your, your students graduate from college with no debt. We talked about all the different types of financial aid. Um, we talked about getting into the FAFSA application itself. We did a basic overview, if you will, of just, you know, financial literacy and even about um, how to choose colleges based upon cost and how to go about you know, selecting all of those. So thank you for all of this wealth of resources and information and wisdom um, to all of our panelists. Um, again, before we even close out, can you just share a little about any closing or any final remarks um, that you may have? And Ms. Davis, we can start with you. Any final closing remarks that you wanna share with our parents, with our students, based upon all the experience that you have that you're bringing to the table today? Sure thing. Um, the first tip I would um, leave you all with is that we understand that it could be a little scary, but you can get through it. Um, also, you want to make sure that you are completing your FS, uh, FSA ID um, correctly and that you're linking it to an active email address and email account. There are so many times where our students link it to a Hotmail that they don't ever use or Yahoo. And so then um, that same FSA ID information you use every year. So what we're telling you is great information because you're going to just, you're not just going to use it for one year. You're going to continue to use it um, and just Stay grinding. It, we know that this could be a little overwhelming. So my, my hope to you is that you take away some information. And then if you don't understand it all at this point in time, because you may not be here at that point in time, rewatch it because we're gonna bring it to you on demand. So you're gonna have access to this information um, more than just once. So great for being here, great for, for doing your due diligence because it will pay off. Absolutely. Mr. Johnson, share any, any final comments or, that you wanna share with our parents and students. Um, um, sure. Um, the one thing that I would definitely say is don't wait until you um, get to 12th grade to start this process. Great point. Um, I, I, I strongly encourage, especially young people, if you, if you don't start it at no other time, at least start when you become a junior in high school. That's when the process should, should really um, start. Um, take those college placement exams in the 11th grade, SAT, ACT. If you need help, just seek me out. I am here to help you. We offer free service here at the University of Maryland College Park. 
Um, um, one of the philosophies that I've always lived with that I would like to pass on to the young people and their parents, if you, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So uh, don't procrastinate. Um, buckle down, do what it is that you need to do, and, um, and, and, and the sky's the limit for you. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, too. And Ms. Parson, any, any parting words for our parents or our, our students? Sure. So just three points. Uh, the one, the fast application is really not that hard. They, uh, students and parents think that it is. It's really not. It's just asking for information that you just have to enter in. Uh, the second point is, is that the financial aid office, especially if you know that your student has made a decision on the university that they plan to attend, the university uh, financial aid office is a resource to help answer any of those questions if you, if you need us to, to to help, um, you know, while you're going through that process. And then lastly, um, planning, planning for college is like planning for retirement because, mm -hmm. you know, if you start early and, you know, like Mr. Johnson said, if, if you plan early and you, you search for scholarship funding and um, just 529 plans, as it has been mentioned before, and that's set up at an early, you know, early on stage, then, um, you know, once you get to the point when you're in college or you're about to go to college, you'll have all that funding already set up. Much like retirement, you know, you're, you start working, you put away money, you know, at the point when you know when you won't be working anymore so that you can live the rest of your life and have some sort of income. So, um, you know, definitely, you know, all the points that were given, um, financial aid office is a definite resource to ask those questions to and to adhere to. And it's not a hard process. It's really not. And thank you for, for every last one of you, Miss um, Davis, Mr. Johnson, and Ms. Carson for sharing, again, all this wisdom and all of these resources. Thank you again for um, coming on to this workshop and sharing with all of our parents. Now, please, because you said that you're here for us, you're here for the parents. So please provide for our, our parents and our participants um, your contact information, and we'll post it on the screen. So how can people get in touch with you, Ms. Davis? The best way, um, because we are still virtual, is to contact our office. Um, the best way is via email um, or going to our Bowie State website, which is www.bowiestate.edu. If they have questions about um, once they're admitted to Bowie State, we would love to help you. Um, and we can be reached via email at financialaid at bowiestate.edu. And we also offer virtual appointments online to our students um, and parents as well. So we are here in more, more ways than we can count. Okay, and Mr. Johnson, how can people get in touch with you? Oh, definitely. Um, well, the office number uh, where I can be reached is 301-429-5939, or I can be reached at my email, ejohns, the number 25 at umd.edu. We do do Zoom appointments and we do assist um, parents and students with scholarship help, um, fast for preparation, so forth and so on. Okay, and Ms. Carson? Sure. So, um, our email, I'm uh, sorry. So our um, website at our financial aid office is uh, financialaid.umd.edu. Our contact information is on that webpage and our phone hours, they do change th throughout the year, depending on peak season. Um, our number is 301-314-8377 to contact either the admission or financial aid office. Um, emailing us, UMD, F I N A I D at umd.edu. Um, you can email us with questions. Um, we can uh, help prospective students, and we also can answer more specific questions for our admitted students as well. Beautiful. And I thank you all again for, for sharing that information and making yourselves available um, to all of these parents and these students that have watched this particular um, workshop. And now we have time to ask some live questions from our PTA parents participating live with us today. Um, so please use the Q&A tab. And what's gonna happen is I'm gonna read the question um, and direct it to our panelists. So again, this is our Q&A tab to be able to come and ask um, your questions and we'll have our panelists 
um, answer those for you. Again, that's the Q&A tab for that. I'll read the question and direct them to our panelists. Great, so again, if we have any questions, please, we are here to answer those questions for you. As a matter of fact, there was a question that came through that says, um, basically, what if the student is on their own? Um, what if the parents are not um, able to sign or give up tax information and how will they go about doing so? So I don't know if Ms. Davis or Ms. Jamila, if we could be able to respond um, to that question. Again, it was a great question, but we want to be able to see what can we tell um, this particular student who does not have that parental um, support. Sure, I'll go ahead and take that one. So um, yes, as we spoke earlier about special circumstances, there are special circumstances um, with each institution as well um, as different processes. Also, the federal government does give an option um, for what is called a um, parent refusal, which will still allow the student to obtain some type of funding. Generally, it is still a student loan, but some type of funding to assist with their education. So there are options. Perfect, all right. And Jamila, did you wanna share? Yeah, and depending on the university as well. So um, I know for College Park, it's, it will be considered a dependency of pill. Because um, generally, um, students who are under the age of 24, they are required to list their parents on their FAFSA application. That's not anything that's necessary that can be gotten around. But if the uh, parents are refusing to put their information on, on the FAFSA application, then as um, Ms. Davis has stated, there is a process where uh, each institution can take that information into account and review it. It's much like a special circumstances um, appeal. And depending on the information that is given uh, to that uh, financial aid office, then they can um, generally um, approve it. But again, it's circumstances and depending on what's happening, where it can or, or may not be approved. Gotcha. But the student can still get funding or federal funding. Perfect. And that's good to know that even when it's a situation like that, that they are truly not alone, that there are some, um, some funds and some options for them. Um, and thank you for asking that question. Again, that's a real world. <laughs> that's a real life kind of stuff, right? So we, we definitely appreciate that. And again, you all just, uh, what, if you do have any other questions, please place them in the Q&A uh, tab. Um, but again, we just wanna thank the Kappa Alpha Psi Foundation of Maryland, our panelists with their wealth of information, wealth of um, resources, and really, if you haven't noticed during this whole webinar, the wealth of passion um, that all of our panelists show to helping um, people out, helping students and parents out. And of course, to Dr. Ted Blakeney, the visionary behind all of the workshops that are offered to parents, um, the one who has the passion again for helping young adults become successful in their higher learning. We want to thank him as well. There was one other question that was asked about, how do we see this in replay? So again, we're gonna have this on demand. So we're gonna place that in our chat window as well. And that's a way that you can be able to um, get a hold of this um, webinar uh, on demand as well. And we do have one more question that is coming through. It is, um, where should we go to find out more about University of Maryland Merit Scholarships? So for our University of Maryland um, panelists, again, the question was, where should we go to find out more about the University of Maryland Merit Scholarships? Sure, you can visit the financial aid website, uh, financialaid.umd.edu. Um, and there is some information on the website under types of aid where you can research merit scholarship. The uh, admissions office, uh, when students apply to University of Maryland as incoming students, whether it be freshmen or transfer students, is uh, when the admissions office reviews each student for the merit scholarship. Merit is highly competitive and I cannot stress any more than that. That is highly, extremely competitive trying to get the merit uh, scholarship. Um, there is a, a limited amount of funding that is available for a merit scholarship each academic eight year. And because all the students that apply to the university are uh, you know, like those top tier students, they're looking for 
um, you know, just other type of criteria that they can, um, that the student can stand out from when they start awarding. But the admissions office, um, their, their webpage as well, um, you can find out more information about the, the merit scholarship or just the different types. Um, but again, the merit scholarship applying to the university is also the application for the merit review at the same time. So there's nothing separate that needs to be submitted to the University of Maryland uh, for that merit scholarship. Okay, and thank you again for Tyra for asking that question. We have another question um, from Brooke. Brooke's asking, um, can the Bowie representative basically answer the same question on behalf of getting more information about the uh, merit scholarships? Sure, no problem. Just like Ms. Parsons said, um, our, office, our admissions office also um, handles the merit awarding for incoming freshman students because they see the transcripts and the um, information coming in for new students. Um, our merit awards for returning or um, concurrent students are based upon their GPA on an acad um, every year on an annual basis after they receive their GPA from um, after their first academic year. Um, there are some other uh, scholarships like um, we discussed in the package, such as a transfer scholarship and things of that nature, which are also once again handled with our Office of Admissions once they go through that process. Perfect. And again, parents, thank you for hanging in there with us. I know um, for the most part, whether parents, you're doing this on your job, and I'm sure um, everyone feels zoomed out, but we wanted you to be able to tap into a wealth of resources, a wealth of information on behalf of helping you to become successful with you and your student so that you can um, get through uh, the college journey, if you will, um, without being so bruised up and everything. So we just, again, wanted to make sure that we can uh, empower you with information on how to, you know, graduate without or little debt, you know, with, not without debt, but, you know, at least little debt, right, Mr. Johnson? I know you were um, saying about that um, earlier. I know it may be realistic, but we wanted to be able to bring everyone um, on board tonight. And thank you for asking your questions, because this is, again, a wealth of uh, information, of resources, and of experience that we have on our panel uh, today. So just wanted to see if there was any other questions? Again, thank you, Brooke, for asking that question as well. And I don't see any other questions in our Q&A tab. So again, to thank you again to Dr. Blakeney for being the visionary behind this. We want to be able to offer even more um, workshops to you to empower the parents because it can be very overwhelming. But because there is a, an Earl Johnson, a Danielle Davis, a Jamila Parson um, standing on by, you know, helping to... Um, support you and um, inform you with all the information that you need. Other than that, we will say good night and thank you again for joining us on this financial aid workshop where we were trying to empower you and um, help and assist you with how to graduate college with little to no debt. So thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you.